thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, I think it's also timely to discuss about its issues uh, with regard to ATMP, cell and gene therapies, and real world evidence. Next slide, please. I think it's clear that um, uh, these products and these medicinal uh, products represent a step change in treatment as they address the underlying genetic causes of diseases rather than managing symptoms over a patient's lifetime. And all to the old, I think the potential was already said to alleviate the burden of specific diseases on, on health systems. They also pose some challenges to these health systems as they come to the market with uncertain evidence and safety profiles and very high price tags. And as a result, we have to be prepared because we should unlock the potential of these products. And the first question is, what's so different with these products? And um, here you see a list of, of these specificity, specificities related to gene therapies and ATMPs. Most of them are one off treatments or they are proposed as one uh, single treatments, uh, which is of course a um, uh, paradigm shift in treatments. They are oriented to a limited population and you see immediately that when they are oriented to a limited population, rare diseases, and Professor Fellini has already uh, stressed that uh, we have um, to deal with small population groups. And of course, it's difficult to have the uh, randomized clinical trials uh, in a, a normal way. They are pot potential curative. Of course, we need to uh, have the proof of the pudding and that needs, of course, data gathering to have this follow up uh, on, on a long term. Um, they are groundbreaking and they, they come to the market with um, <clears throat> uh, improvement of standard of care, but also with some uncertainties and uncertainties also with related to outcomes. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Yes, they are different, and that uh, implies that we need to apply a different approach to integrate them in our health systems. I'm uh, speaking as a payer. Uh, I was former head of the Belgian health insurance, and I'm uh, set up uh, recently also a platform, re real world evidence for decisions, a multi stakeholder platform. I come back to that. Um, of course, this current landscape is moving and let's have the, the next slide please. This is only the reference of the article. But in this article is an interesting graph, an interesting uh, figure with relation to the problem we are discussing uh, today. And you see that um, uh, um, um, above you see that the type of pivotal evidence which is gathered is small open label, not randomized single uh, studies, single arm studies without control of using historical controls. And when you see in the article, the number of patients which are involved, you see they are uh, small, uh, small groups. It's related of course, also to the pathology and also for ethical reasons, it's not always possible to have the classical golden standard of randomized clinical, um, stand, uh, clinical um, uh, the golden standard of clinical trials. Uh, they are coming to the market very fast and there is a rationale behind this regulatory flexibility. It's related to the type of the products, the need, the unmet needs, it was already said, orphan drugs, it's special lines of treatment, uh, the heterogeneity of, of the patient population, and also a strong presence of pediatric patient populations, which is itself uh, an, an, an uh, important issue to deal with. Uh, and I, I think uh, Professor Fellini will agree with that. Uh, and then we come, of course, what are the implications of, of, of these elements? We have uncertainty about uh, benefit risk balance, there's early authorized treatments without clear evidence for payers. Of course, they are uh, efficacy um, uh, analysis, but they are conditional reimbursement also, and these conditional approvals and conditional reimbursement are leading to the question, we should have more evidence. Um, they um, are leading to long and extensive post-marketing studies, complex HTA evaluations, 
and uh, they are uh, leading to a lack of reimbursement in uh, the EU uh, uh, because we are not well prepared. And I think uh, the initiative which is taken here has, to, has the ambition to inform uh, you what can be done. And you see on the left side, the potential future approaches to improve robustness of the evidence which should be gathered. Of course, payers are not um, blind uh, payers as such, but they should get, health system should have sufficient evidence. And this is something which have to do together by uh, uh, improving uh, the, the methodologies, the, by improving um, clinical guidelines, by registries data, by robust historical data. And of course, on the European level, some important initiatives uh, have been taken recently. I refer to the um, <coughs> Darwin uh, Network inside EMMA, which will be also a platform together with uh, the um, uh, different health systems. And of course, there's also a, a, a high potential, I think, in the year ends as such to deliver also this uh, evidence and contribute that. That's the, the image uh, to understand why this is uh, an issue um, and why we are obliged to find complementary evidence. Uh, it's not a question of a shift from our RCT to um, uh, other um, uh, evidence when needed, yes, but it's not a question of bypassing. And, and I will uh, immediately show why there is some reluctance uh, uh, with the payer community. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and you see uh, a recent analysis was made with regard to um, um, the impact of our health systems on the different elements. And one uh, element which was um, pointed out very clearly is the uh, necessity uh, to develop rules for real world data leading to real world evidence and collection to curtail the uncertainty around curative therapy uh, durability. And the establishment of, of the, right, the right tools may be a condition to access at launch. And that's what we are doing for the moment. It's trying to uh, create uh, tools and create methods to improve the, um, uh, the uh, to, to limit the gap which exists on, on uh, evidence. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Indeed, real world evidence, a new age is a question mark because it's not so new as it may seem because in post-marketing studies, real world evidence is already applied. It's not new as such, but it's new for decisions for reimbursement and access to the market. That's a very, very clear thing. And we see uh, in, th in this article, uh, we, we, the, the number and, and the evolution of publications with regard to real world evidence was mentioned in 2011 we are, uh, in PubMed. We, can, we could see 500 publications. Now we are all over 2,500 a year with regard to this problem. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and payers are reluctant and they were hesitant. And I have mentioned here that uh, nevertheless, there is an increasing interest, and there should be an increasing interest from the payer side to uh, um, uh, apply the potential of real-world data, real-world evidence. There is a need to reduce uncertainties at market launch. That's clear. That's that's we, we should do together. It's a multi-stakeholder approach. We have the opportunities. We we can deliver data. Thus, we should use them. That's a moral a moral duty to 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 do so. And third, uh, we have uh, this policy developments which are on the way, and especially, uh, of course, the pharmaceutical strategy, the strategic plans of EMA, but also recently the EU, uh, EU health data space proposal, which was launched the 3rd of May um, um, this month. Uh, but nevertheless, um, payers stay cautious and have different concerns. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, that's referred, you know, very well. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> um, recently, uh, it is a recent publication, uh, the HTA bodies have assessed um, their um, attitudes. It was um, uh, clearly 
um, uh, an, an inventory of, of the um, uh, concerns by payers and HTA uh, within uh, 20 HTA uh, bodies in the European Union. It's giving, uh, I think, a good uh, insight in what's happening. And let's look to the figures uh, which are behind. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide. Yes, which are the barriers to real world data and to real world evidence? Because first we have to 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 manage real world uh, data uh, in in order to set them and lead them to real world evidence. There is a necessary uh, data. Uh, the necessity of of data sources is of course one of the the major concerns. Um, uh, the existing policy structure. It needs a governance. It was already said we should be aware that there is sufficient um, clarity with regard to data altruism, to the governance of the data, the data privacy, and, and so on. This security must be given uh, to patients. Um, uh, there are difficulties to um, the, the, the quality of the data. And there's a need, of course, to verify and to interpret the data. There is an, a need for resources of data analytics also, especially um, uh, when it comes to HTA bodies and, and payers. There's a lack of methods to use real world data. It's not a buzzword. It should be done on an, in an, a way which is trustworthy and which is leading to, um, uh, to good results. There's a long time to access to data. We should, uh, the availability of data, and you see immediately in the European context, it's not easy to do uh, 27 times the same thing. It's not easy for small countries to deliver um, uh, real world evidence when <clears throat> uh, they have uh, five or, or, or six patients uh, in, in their populations, which it, it can be uh, interested in, in this treatment. It is work together. It's work which should be done on a European level. And I'm very grateful to, um, to can explain a little bit this concern. Um, there is also the, the, the problem of, of financial is, issues who will pay for all this. Uh, uh, and there's a lot, uh, as I said already, a lack of, of resources and, and clinical analysts. Next slide, please. That's all the practical concerns. Uh, there are, of course, also um, possibilities to improve this situation, and we should find responses to these barriers and to these um, 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 questions which are made by uh, HTA. It's clear that we believe that uh, we should focus on uh, certain areas, and I, I think it was um, very good um, summarized by uh, Ashley Jackson from the United States, who is working also with, together with real world um, evidence for decisions. It's a consensus driven research agenda. What should be done to unlock the potential? It's not unlocking the potential. What should be done to, to, do, to, to arrive to the, uh, uh, to the results? Do we have the, the infrastructure? Do we have standardized processes for validating real world data and real world evidence? And how can we assess and uh, adopt the best practices? That's what should be done uh, on, uh, on the floor. And of course, we need a macro environment and a macro um, uh, um, context which allows to do so and to make progress. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, uh, for instance, we, we have made, uh, uh, an, uh, made um, uh, a list and, um, of the responsibilities and the, the, the task, the missions, the different stakeholders, both payers, health industry, government, and so on, uh, should have in this regard, but we have no time to go inside. I, I only mentioned that this real world evidence for decision is a payer-led initiative which is multi-stakeholder and which is based on a learning by doing approach, a practical approach, uh, working together with international, um, uh, with international um, uh, organizations and even transatlantic with our Canadian friends. Next slide, please. And I will finish soon. To conclude, 
real world evidence, um, as uh, we should consider, it, could not be seen as a panacea. It's not a standalone issue. It's not real world evidence or nothing. It's a complementary, as Dr. Ferlini has already mentioned. But it's a vital part, uh, and it should be a vital part of integrated evidence generation plans. It's needed that we have ongoing structural dialogues among the different stakeholders among the life cycle to develop this further. And there are initiatives, uh, UNETA, the HTA, uh, Real World for Decision, a lot of, of, of initiatives which are taken. And it's necessary to not do it on its own and trial and try it out. We should come and move from fragmented recommendations to comprehensive guidance and improvement of the standards of uh, real world data studies. I think that's important. It was also said that uh, some of these products are, are <coughs> related to uh, outcome based plans. And I think that these outcome based plans should contain also a real world evidence generation plan, which is based on robust standards. And there is a need to support decision makers to the sharing of practical learnings. And we have uh, already launched a call on a European wide to set up a learning network, bringing together the different partners uh, from uh, HTA bodies and payers to do so and to be familiar with that. And last slide, and it's only to, to give you some references. Next slide, please. Uh, recently, um, uh, it's clear that uh, more efficient negotiations for innovative uh, therapies um, implies also a value-based negotiation network, which is taken into regard, of course, the potential of real-world evidence and real-world data. I thank you so much.